Well, welcome uh, everybody to this general meeting of the Emeritus College. Uh, I'm Joost Blom, Professor Emeritus of Law and uh, Principal of the College this year. And um, I would like to uh, just take a moment to acknowledge before we get started that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And I would also like to acknowledge that you, our participants, are joining us today from many places near and far. And I acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Please note also uh, just a housekeeping matter that this event is being recorded for public use and will be posted on the website of the college and you will receive a link uh, to this recording after it's been posted. Now the uh, just the program for this afternoon is we'll have a short uh, business meeting, not that there's any votes to be taken. Well, there is actually a vote to be taken, uh, but it's a poll. Um, but I'll get to that at the end. Uh, but just some items I'd like to draw to your attention that are happening uh, and or have happened with the Emeritus College. Uh, and then um, uh, Pro Professor uh, Sandra Bressler will uh, introduce uh, our speaker for this afternoon. Um, the first item that I'd just like to tell you about a bit is um, the uh, survey, uh, that which many of you will have participated in, um, that we took of our members uh, uh, sort of in the spring of last year. And, um, uh, and then one of the items that emerged from that survey on which we've We've already uh, taken some action. The um, we were very gratified, actually, at the extent of participation in our survey. Um, the survey was put together by uh, Ann Junker, our vice principal, this year, and um, she uh, told me that the total membership that we might have. Uh, in other words, it's everybody in theory who is an, uh, entitled to be a member of our college. Uh, there are 1,740 of you, but uh, we only have active emails for about two thirds of that total, 1,230. But of the 1,230 who got our uh, survey request, 37% uh, responded 456. So that's a very good response rate. Uh, and we were very happy at both that we got such a high response rate and at the uh, level of the responses, because the, a lot of you, more than half, provided verbal comments as well as uh, sort of the numerical responses. And we were also happy to see that 87% of uh, the ones who responded were said they were satisfied with their retirement. Um, the, the one item that I'd just like to highlight uh, this time round is the uh, special interest groups, which as you know, uh, we have at the college and, and which are a focus for um, sort of activities that, that di of different interests that people have. And one of the things that comes very clearly out of the responses to the survey is that there's high interest in having more of these special interest groups on more things on more additional topics such as outdoor physical activity uh, family and community uh, culinary uh, interests uh, music and arts appreciation those were the most popular uh, top potential topics that were mentioned uh, two new to uh, special interest groups are underway, uh, thanks largely to the initiative of my predecessor as principal, Graham Wynn. Um, Easy Riders, which is a bicycling uh, uh, group, and a reading club called Groves of Academe, which is going to focus particularly on writing about universities. Um, th what council did at its last meeting uh, 
uh, a week or so ago, uh, is to uh, approve new guidelines for setting up uh, special interest groups and for the operation of special interest groups. They will be posted soon on the website, uh, and they will outline what it takes to start up a new special interest group, which is actually not very much. There's not much red tape. Um, the support that the uh, Emeritus College office can provide those who are interested, um, what the conveners of the group are responsible for, they're largely self-operated groups. Uh, that's part of their, their flexibility and their strength. Uh, and we hope uh, in with these guidelines and just by generally getting the word out to encourage um, uh, a substantial uh, response and some get some new groups going. Um, next item that I'd just like to mention is that uh, last Friday, the 1st of October, which was the International Day of Older Persons, um, we, the Emeritus College, participated jointly with the European Association of Professors Emeriti in an online event focusing on healthy aging. And again, I, I'm sure a number of you watched that. Um, and there were four presentations, two by representatives or, or members of the European Association, Sir Les Ebden and Professor Jochen Erich, and two from the UBC, Emeritus College, Judith Hall and John Helliwell. Uh, and the uh, planning uh, for this event was uh, led by Diane Newell, um, a former, uh, actually, president of the Association of Professors Emeriti, and, uh, and Ann Junker, our vice principal, was one of the moderators of the uh, program as well. And uh, Sandra van Ark, our administrative manager, handled the technical logistics. And it was a great success, uh, I think. Uh, we had about 140 some odd uh, attendees. There will be a, a video recording uh, of the event posted. Uh, all registrants should get an email with the link um, and it'll also be posted on our website uh, uh, within, uh, within a short time. Uh, the uh, Last thing I'd like to highlight uh, is the two awards um, that uh, the Emeritus College offers. Um, and uh, we are, this is a, a sort of first um, uh, move to get nominations for these awards because uh, we'd like to have as big a pool of nominations as we can get. Uh, there are two annual awards. They're annual in the sense that we decide on them annually, but they don't have to be awarded every year. Uh, recipients get $1,000 uh, as part of the award. Uh, one is the, uh, the newer, newer of the two awards is the Award for Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors um, offered by the Emeritus College. Uh, and that is for um, emeriti who have demonstrated excellence in their engagement in innovative research, artistic creation, or new applications of previous research since attaining emeritus status. Uh, so that's the uh, in Excellence in Innovative and Creative Endeavors Award. The other one for which uh, we want to uh, encourage nominations is the President's Award, uh, that is the President of the University's Award for Distinguished Service uh, for emeriti who have, since attaining emeritus status, displayed exceptional leadership in volunteer community services. Um, yeah, you can nominate, you cannot nominate yourself for either of these awards. Uh, you have to get someone else to do it. Um, but you can nominate multiple people, uh, if you wish. Uh, the, the online nomination form, which the website will uh, 
include uh, will be posted uh, in the course of this month, I think, where the, the nomination season hasn't really formally begun yet. But uh, we are, we do, please do start thinking about if you know people who should be nominated for either of these awards or check the website for the descriptions of the awards. There's more to it than I just explained. Uh, and uh, when the nomination forms are there, uh, please do uh, nominate one or more people, um, which will really help uh, generate, uh, I think, momentum for these awards. Uh, last thing is just for me to introduce a short poll uh, that we you, you are being used as kind of a sample group. Um, our next uh, general meeting of the college is scheduled for Wednesday, November the 17th, but it is a concert in Barnett Hall at the School of Music uh, with Jane Coop on uh, piano and David Gillum on violin. And it's our first in-person event since the pandemic began. Uh, and because of that, uh, we just like to get uh, your, uh, just your responses to how you uh, feel about uh, attending this event. You're not, these are anonymous responses. We're just interested in kind of, of what sort of attendance we may get and, and, uh, and, and, various things that people uh, think about uh, in deciding whether to come. So the, um, there are two questions and there should be up on the screen in front of you. And um, you can then, I think, just respond uh, as... Uh, yes, yeah, okay. it's up there. Up and Responses are coming in. Yeah. Okay, I don't get any more response. So I think we're good to go about 50% um, says no, they will not, they're not planning to attend. And for most of them for 50% is COVID is the reason for that. So we'll take that into consideration. And we'll update you on our events. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody for, uh, for helping us out with that. Um, and that concludes the uh, business part of our uh, general meeting today. And now I will uh, turn it over to our uh, member at large of our council, uh, Sandra Bressler, who will introduce the speaker for today. Thank you, Joost. So today's topic is a tribute to Cornelia Han Oberlander, and it will be given by uh, Professor Susan Harrington, who is a professor in the School of Architecture and Landscape and Landscape Architecture. Susan is a professor in the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She resides in British Columbia and is a landscape architect in Canada and a registered landscape architect in the United States. She is author of several books, including Cornelia Hahn Oberlander, Making the Modern Landscape, which won the J.B. Jackson Book Prize from the Foundation for Landscape Studies in New York. Her research examines the intersections between design and critical thinking in landscape architecture and ways land landscape architects can contribute to children's environments. And Susan will be delivering her talk after which there will be um, a, a opportunity for questions and answers. And if you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the chat room and we'll be addressing it then. So Susan. Thank you. Share screen here. Can everyone see that okay? Looks great, thank you. Okay, thank you. And thank you for having me, it's an honor to be here. Um, as you may have known, Corin Amelia passed away in May of 2021 this year. And um, so it's, it's an honor to reflect on her, her life and her work and her career and all her contributions. Um, so 
I'm just going to talk a little bit about the early years. And then she really has these sort of three layers of her career. First is this social com commitment through public work. And then um, the human environment. And then she becomes very active in the ecological environment towards the later years of her life. Um, so this is a picture of her when she's about 14. Cornelia was born in Germany. And um, she grew up in the suburbs of Anzi, uh, Berlin in uh, during the Weimar period. And so it was a very effervescent time period. And um, her father was in the seamless piping business and her mother was an author of gardening books for children. And uh, she did a little gardening herself and she had horses in England that she would go and ride. She was obviously well off, but it was a, a, a really wonderful childhood um, until 1932. These are some of the, the books that uh, Beata Hahn, Cornelia's mother, created. And um, I, this is how I sort of got connected to Cornelia because I was in a German archive um, in Berlin and I discovered this author, Beata Hahn, and um, she had these wonderful illustrations. So this is one of the ones from her book from 1936, which it's really kind of a landscape plan and the pathway leads you through all these great thinkers on children and, and nature. And I was really curious about her work and I asked the archivist um, what had happened to Beata Hahn and she said, oh, she just disappeared. She hasn't, she never published anything after 1936 and that always stuck with me and made me very suspicious what had happened to her. So a few years later, I was interviewing Cornelia Hahn Oberlander um, about Expo 67. And uh, this was a place base that she designed there in Montreal. And uh, towards the end of the interview, I said, I know this is just, you know, a strange question, but have you ever heard of Beata Hahn? And she said, that's my mother. And I just couldn't believe it. And then Cornelia produced the original of this drawing from her closet here in Vancouver and uh, shared it with me. And then she told me how she created all the renderings for her mother's book as a child. So I just knew then and there that Cornelia would be a woman that history would not forget. And that was really the impetus of, of me writing uh, the book on her. Um, so Cornelia's father died in um, 1933 in an avalanche um, in Switzerland. And um, this, this photo was taken just a few uh, weeks before um, the night of broken glass in, in Berlin. And as you can see, she's um, quite miserable and they eventually fled Germany and came to the United States first. And um, there her mother bought a farm in Wolfboro, um, New Hampshire. And Cornelia got into Smith College and she attended the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture, essentially for young women. And here she is, she would come back on the weekends with the friends of hers from Smith um, to help her, her mother out in the garden. Um, and she had, an interesting time at Smith because she was really trying to fit in. She was trying to become North American. She changed the way she dressed, the way she did her hair. Um, Betty Friedan, who you may have heard of, that she was a big uh, woman's liver um, who wrote The Feminine Mystique. Uh, um, she was known as Betty Goldstein then. Her room was across from Cornelia's in the dorm at Smith and they often butted heads. I could tell you lots of stories about that, but I won't. But in uh, after the bombing of Pearl, um, Pearl Harbor, Smith College uh, offered to transfer some of their female students into Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. And uh, Cornelia was one of them. So in 1943, she got a, a letter from the Dean of the Graduate School of Design um, admitting her into the landscape architecture program, which was just perfect for her because she had been exposed to modern architecture um, as a young girl in Weimar, Germany. And uh, there are obviously people who had fled uh, Germany who were teaching there, like such as Walter Gropius and Marcel Brewer, um, who would become her professors. And Cornelia was actually in the second cohort of females to ever be admitted into the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. And it was also an interesting time in terms of pedagogy because Gropius and um, his colleagues were bringing in this sort of uh, Bauhaus preliminary design 
uh, exercises. So these next few photos I took from the archives at Harvard. And these were exercises really based on um, uh, Johannes Itten's work, uh, who developed a lot of the of the pedagogy and the design thinking um, in uh, the preliminary program that they were trying to import. And this would have been the first sort of modern uh, architectural education in North America that Corny was participating in it. And uh, so she graduates in 1947. Here she is, um, ready to take on the world and looking very North American. And uh, one of her first jobs uh, was in Philadelphia, and it was with the uh, Citizens Council on Community Planning. So she was very interested in revitalizing um, sort of urban cores that had deteriorated during World War II. And she did a lot, a lot of community work. So when we think of you know, architects, landscape architects working with communities, we tend to think of the 60s, but this was 1951. And here she was doing community garden, uh, Operation Fix Up. She had a whole program where she went in and she painted people's houses, um, created gardens, um, and did all kinds of things one-on-one uh, -on -one with community members. She also designed parks, and because she had been through this modernist uh, design curriculum, uh, a lot of the architects who were there in Philadelphia just marveled at her plan. So this is her plan for John Hay uh, Neighborhood Park Association, and it's what we call very modern design. It used just very basic shapes, um, just a very reduced planting palette, and um, you know, even the way that it's rendered with Leroy lettering, what would have been a modern method. So she immediately caught the eye of architectural luminaries, uh, Louis Kahn, as well as Dan Kiley, the landscape architect. And she was soon working on um, really famous projects such as the Mill Creek project in uh, Philadelphia, which was a, a large redevelopment uh, of area um, that she spent an extensive amount of time working with Dan Kiley and Louis Kahn. In fact, I was challenged by an architectural historian that Cornelia had never worked with the great Louis Kahn and Dan Kiley. And then I noted that in the drawing, there is her name, Cornelia Hahn. She did, in fact, <laughs> work in Philadelphia on this famous project. Um, and of course, she appeared in, this is from Progressive Architecture in the 1950s, you can see Cornelia Hahn. And she had very interesting ways of calculating all the plants and making sure everyone got the same amount of plants. She was very democratic in these, these public housing projects. Unfortunately, they didn't install a lot of the landscapes. And um, uh, in the, a lot of the projects eventually were torn down. Um, she also created one of her first playgrounds, and this was at 18th Street and Bigler Street in Philadelphia. And this is what she calls Goat Mountain. So she was uh, really keen on creating these innovative pieces of sculpture uh, for the kids to play on. And it was a very innovative park, and it made it, it was featured in Life magazine. In 1953, she married Peter Oberlander, and Peter uh, had been an architecture student and then later a planning student at Harvard. And um, they had met at Walden Pond during an event there and it continued to keep in touch. And eventually he uh, married her and convinced her to move to Canada where he had a job at UBC. And uh, so they left for uh, Vancouver. And so this was a big move for Cornelia. Um, and you know she was coming to a much smaller city. She had lived in you know, Philadelphia and New York City, actually wedded in New York City. Um, but she also said it was very exciting because there weren't all these sort of establishments controlling the culture and art around the city. And they were also, the city at this time uh, in the late 50s and early 60s was also embarking on sort of shared public or subsidized housing. And so since she had this background in Philadelphia, she was sort of a natural to select as landscape architects. So this is a project that still um, exists. It's McLean Park housing and she designed the landscape. It was all installed and as well as these play sculptures that she was developing. Here's another view of it taken by the amazing Selin Pullen. And I think the fact that they did install her plants made a huge difference to these um, housing developments. I don't think that's the main reason why they weren't torn down to them because you now have these big giant stately trees that you would see 
you know, planting the Shaughnessy or something, but they're planting it around these very modest um, housing developments. And they also built a house um, in Acadia Road on UEL. And so here's Cornelia in 1970s with her three children. And uh, it's a, one of my favorite uh, photographs. And she would uh, continue to work on housing of all types. And this is one of her first housing projects um, for the Freedmen. So some of you might know um, Sydney and, and Constant Friedman. They were some of the first um, faculty members to be hired at UBC um, Faculty of Medicine. And uh, as I understand, they were big proponents of recruiting other people to UBC. And Cornelia designed uh, the garden with the architect Fred Lasserre. So if you've ever uh, on the UBC campus, the Lasserre building is named after Fred Lasserre. He unfortunately died shortly after this project, but Cornelia really worked hard with him to fit the structure to the land. She would continue to work for the Freedmen's um, till 2011 um, and uh, continually adding to their landscape there. This is another residence. Again, so these were modest 1950s houses that she wanted to create places for families to use their outdoor spaces with. And she developed all these clients were lifelong clients of hers. In 1967, um, she was asked um, to work on the Canadian section of the Children's Creative Center at Expo 67. And she was actually hired to create a holding area. <laughs> and Cornelia quickly convinced them that she was going to design to be equally creative as the indoor space. So if you look down here, you see my cursor, that's her play space. And underneath was uh, places for children to learn about painting and music and pottery and other creative ende endeavors. And this really starts to launch her kind of interest in the human environment um, because she begins to see how her children are playing and how the children use the environment as sources of play. And she created this beautiful uh, plan view of that play environment. So there's lots of loose parts, there's lots of nature, there's lots of risk taking, and it was extremely popular. It, uh, a 1968 analysis of the Children's Creative Center found that the outdoors was the most popular part uh, of the whole um, Children's Creative Center. In fact, I run into adults today who fondly remember playing in Cornelia's um, outdoor play environment create a whole bunch of play environments throughout Vancouver, kind of using a similar approach. So these, a whole series of outdoor play spaces for the North Shore Neighborhood House in North Vancouver in the 1960s, where she would design everything. Um, she would bring in giant trees that the kids could use as balancing beams. Um, she really kind of pushed this idea of the wobble wall, which you see much shorter versions of now. As you can see, this is truly risky play. <laughs> Uh, which is very popular now, but she was doing this in the 60s. These are like four foot high uh, logs that the kids are, are walking on. She created areas for them to swim and uh, just really delightful environments. She then met uh, the architect, Arthur Erickson, and um, Erickson had just been approved to create Robson Square, which is this three block long project um, with the side, the, a skyscraper lying down on its side. And he had planned all these gardens to be created, uh, particularly in the center block, which we call Robson Square. And so he, Bing Tom, who was working for Arthur at the time, called up Cornelia and said, what would you do? And Cornelia had a lot of good points and she gave a presentation and she was hired that day to work on the project. And uh, she was working on it, uh, you know, for the next 60 years. And this is, uh, you can notice here in my cursor, that's what's now the VAG. So you can see Robson Square was mainly surface parking and one story buildings. So it was very um, underdeveloped. And folks, a lot of North American cities looked like this, just tons of surface parking. And so it was an exciting, really exciting project in which she really mastered uh, her technical skill to bring natural elements into our environment. 
So here's a plan of that three block project. Here's uh, the model, uh, one of the initial early models that was approved showing the, the law courts and then Robson Square and what we now call the VAG. She also met a lot of young architects in this project, people like Eva Matsuzaki and uh, Nick Malkovich, who she would continue to collaborate with way on into the, the 21st century. And her job was really to link these very different architectures. So we had this, you know, sort of more 19th century Ecole de Beaux-Arts uh, structure with an underground structure, which is Robson Square, with Arthur Erickson's law courts. And she really did this uh, beautifully, a lot with the paving and creating uh, paving that sort of matched, uh, you can notice that sort of a rose colored paving and that matched the rose color in the, and so she only years of plantings, green, sort of this rose color and white, and that was it throughout the entire three block project to kind of bring it together. And she also created these really novel diagrams where she was looking at the site in terms of levels because it was six levels, three underground, three above ground. And at each level, she had a different program and a different kind of feeling for that space. And here it is built, an Esto project. And it's just a beautiful uh, example of landscape and architecture. So here uh, a waterfall becomes the wall to an interior space that pours down to a ceiling that's underneath. Um, here's a, a section of Robson Square. Mounds. And again, when the water is on, it's just an amazing environment. And this is a planting that she did. You can see she did an or sort of a, a these white rows with the laurel plants, again, on these side planters, uh, the law courts. And this is her favorite spot in Robson Square. It's the mound that's at, on Hornby in Robson um, that she loves um, to come up to. And I highly recommend you going there. And it was interesting, I've been there so many times with her. And one time I came upon, uh, this man came up to us and he was an accountant. And he thanked Cornelia. He said, you know, I've, I've, I've been coming here for lunch, you know, every summer, like the last 20 years. And I just wanted to thank you. It's a delightful place to have my lunch. And so she was really touched by that. And this is her lay and, and she's, this is along Hornby Street. And you'll notice that this, this sidewalks feels different than other sidewalks in the city because the city demands that trees be planted 10, Meters on the center, and she argued she really wanted to create this dense sort of tunneling along here. So you knew that you were walking across this very special space. She won. She had lots of battles, and she won this battle. So when you walk there, you'll you'll notice the difference. And here's a replanning that was done in 2011. And again, she's like many of her projects. She's been there over and over and over again. And then this is the interior plantings, um, which has kind of an interesting connection because Arthur Erickson actually built the law courts based on the lobby in the uh, law courts of Pompeii. So Cornelia thought that she would take on this uh, similar sort of um, ancient Roman uh, and, and Greek approach uh, to design. So she got trees, um, seeds from, from plane trees from a Dr. W.C. Gibson at UBC and planted them. She also planted orange trees, which um, unfortunately uh, were removed as trees because they said it looked too decadent to have these beautiful oranges <laughs> dropping off the branches. Um, but anyway, lots of battles. Some she won, some she didn't. And she would go on to work with numerous projects. This is the Laxton building. Uh, that got converted uh, into the Evergreen Building in 2009. This is the Chancery uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, from 1989. Again, so she was really careful to match all her plants up with the columns, with mullions, and she worked very closely with Arthur Erickson on all of his projects. And this was uh, probably one of my favorite of their residential projects. This is for the Bagley Wrights uh, outside of Seattle. Um, well, she really started to develop this idea of plant what you see, plant you know what is native to the location. 
And this is one of the last pictures I have of her uh, with Arthur, uh, just a few years before he passed in 2009. Um, she then, um, you'll see this sort of ecological mode when she uh, is, Peter gives her the Bruntlin report called Our Common Future. And it talks about sustainability and the social connectivity uh, of our planet and economic connectivity and the environmental um, connectivity. And Peter put the Bruntlin report in her hands and said, Cornelia, this will change your practice. And she said it did. And this is probably one of the first projects that you can see this, she designed uh, this is the CK Choi building, which you've probably seen with Eva Matsuzaki. Um, that um, was began in 1992. You can see her signature. Um, but it was interesting that from the very get go, they, they wanted to make this as environmentally sensitive as possible. And so this is the parking lot that was there before the Choi, CK Choi building, they decided, um, the whole group, including the university, that the building would match exactly the parking lot footprint so that you would not be disturbing undisturbed land. And they also did a lot of recycling. So if you remember the old auditorium building um, that was across the street, they reused the, the timber um, trusses from that. They made the contractors recycle everything, <laughs> including their lunches. Uh, and they also developed these passive energy systems for the entire building. Um, so passive airflow, um, passive um, sun and shade. And we see that rainwater and gray water being filtered, sedges, sedges I'm sorry, uh, along the CK Choi building. And so that was a, one of the first, you see this quite often now, but this was in you know, the early 1990s. So she was really pioneering this ecological approach to design. Even uh, in the back, some of the soil had become compacted due to construction machinery. So she bought worms to loosen up the soil and then they planted it with the ferns. So everything had this ecological dimension to it. Cornelia was also one of the first landscape architects to just begin to work up north and she worked on was asked to work on the legislative assembly building uh, in the Northwest Territories. In the 1990s, I opened in the 1993 and she developed a bunch of techniques and uh, the same architects that she had worked on with Robson Square were also working on this the architecture for this project. You can see um, bogs and bogs are ecologically so valuable and she invented this what she calls the cookie tray technique where she had them use the front end loader like a giant spatula because they were she discovered when she was on site that they were destroying a, a bog so she had them preserve it by moving it and putting it into sort of bald patches in the existing bog and uh, from what i know that bog is still there it's one of the few it's very hard to to heal a bog. She also uh, discovered that there really were no nurseries way up north. And so she developed this scheme, which she would use in other projects, where she picks the seeds and tissues and other plant parts on the site. She flies them to Vancouver. She propagates them. And then she flies them back uh, to uh, Yellowknife to be Called, called invisible mending. So if you've ever done sewing, it's this idea of um, you know creating a mend that you don't see where the tear is. And so she didn't create gardening beds or anything. She she where places were disturbed, she plant with these these plants that were true um, to the site genetically. They also created a bunch of raised um, pathways throughout the site. And that was done so animals could run freely underneath and not be disturbed by people walking in and out of the building and out to the frame leg trail. The last project I'll share with you is the East Three project, which kind of brings together her interest in children and the North. And uh, it's way above the Arctic Circle. And this was a school that was a combined um, K to grade 12. And 
Uh, it was also a school where they were trying in indigenous knowledge um, in terms of language programs, in terms of outdoor play activities, and the whole consulting uh, dimension to that project. And uh, it's in this very unique environment around the uh, Mackenzie Delta. And, uh, you know, the permafrost is melting there. And so buildings that are built on slabs are all tilting. In fact, the trees, she calls, um, oh, this is just, this is the utilities in Inuvik. So you can't bury the util utilities in melting from permafrost. So they're all raised above ground. Um, and she has this, she said all the trees were tipped over because, and they're called drunk, drunken trees by the locals because they looked drunk <laughs> because they were flopping over. Um, because the permafrost is, and I think, you know, a lot of people think about the things that are happening up north where it's exacerbated, but this, this permafrost was, was definitely, um, another issue was that the Coriolis effect is this movement that's caused by the Earth's rotation is the greatest up north, and the winds had been coming low, and they were actually like burying buildings and um, making it so people couldn't even get out of their houses because of that. So they had to really model the snow movement for the construction of the school. So this is one of these uh, modeling labs. So they're modeling the, the snow and the movement. So here's a plan of the school um, and then these various outdoor play areas and plantings. And, she, this is where I go back to the um, education she had at Harvard, which was based on this Bauhaus or Gestalt theory um, of design. And she had to design a shelter belt that was going to block these winds. And so she used the same approach she used in the 1940s at, the, at Harvard, where you just draw lines across the site and where they intersect, you put a plant, you put a tree to get your final design. So this gives this kind of randomness for the wind. Uh, and then she spread that all, all out over the site where they knew the wind was gonna be coming in with the snow, again, to deflect that. And they also were able to plant large trees with um, the blessing of elders. And here she is with moving her plants up with her grandkids for installation um, in 2011. There she is telling the contractor what to do. <laughs> and here's a, the finished planting for that school. And again, you'll see the buildings are all up on stilts um, because of the melting permafrost. And it opened in 2012. And this is some of the wood that she was able to retrieve from the beautiful sort of silver color uh, for the kids to, to play on. And it's sort of her signature circle that she often uses for children's play spaces. But I'm gonna conclude there. Uh, you may have heard that um, the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture had a, uh, a tribute to her at the Chan Center um, this past Sunday afternoon. It is on YouTube. So if you'd like to view it and learn more about Cornelia, um, you're welcome to do that. Thank you. Luza, thank you so much for such a wonderful tribute to Cornelia. She certainly was a most remarkable woman and landscape architect, and her contributions have, were so vast, not only to yeah. UBC, to Vancouver, but so many places in the world. So it's really wonderful that we were able to honor her this way with your presentation. She, you commented, and I just want to add this in the thanks. She certainly was a woman whose history would not, whose, whose, who history would not forget. And you're so right. <laughs> history will not forget her at all. Yes. So thank you. And now we have any questions that people would like to ask. I do have one question to start with. In everything that she has done, She's always worked in collaboration with others. And collaboration was very important to her when I was doing some research. 
Can you comment on that? What worked well? What were some of the challenges? And how she was able to continue in this way? Because it's really remarkable to work with so many different people from so many different professions and interests. Yeah, I mean, that was something that was modeled for her at Harvard, They because the Bauhaus was very integrated in bringing people from different disciplines together. And um, so a lot of the studio projects were shared among the architecture planning and landscape architecture students. And um, she also, when she was working in Philadelphia, you know, that was very much, she would, she'd come to the offices of Louis Kahn with Dan Kiley and work in the office. The, she did the same thing with, uh, with Arthur Erickson. She would work in his office working on Robson Square. And so that was just part of her, her world method and how she worked yeah. best. And I think she really enjoyed working that way. And actually the only time she was not able to do that was when she was working on Skeena Terrace and McLean housing in Vancouver because um, she got, <laughs> so they told her that she could not collaborate with the architects and she had to sanitize all her drawings <laughs> and um, send them in. <laughs> she was still complaining about this, you know, decades later about <laughs> But so um, it yeah, does have challenges, we know that. Yeah, we but know that, yeah. But certainly from what she did, she was very successful. Yeah, she was very successful. And I think she just connected with so many people and, you know, she um, would, would just, you know, suggest things. I mean, a lot of people enjoy the logs around Vancouver beaches and that was her idea dating back to 1963. Oh. <laughs> she saw that they were taking these logs that were being burned um they had probably broken off a boom or something and they were just burning them on the beach and she said don't what's causing pollution you just arrange them on the sand good idea this is the 60s so you could just sort of suggest things like that <laughs> <laughs> and so they've been doing it since and it's just one of those things you know that she's just got this lasting um, legacy absolutely I do have a question uh, about talking a little more about her work at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC. Yeah. Can you share that with us? Yeah. Of course, yeah. So she began that around the same time as she was working on Robson Square. So in fact, when you see the giant mounds that are out front, that's actually soil removed from Robson Square, which then they had moved to the Museum of Anthropology to create uh, kind of a barrier and kind of an entrance um, uh, to, to Moa. And so she planted that soil with a native Haida mix that uh, she discovered. So this was uh, one of the early sort of ethnobotanists, it was in the 70s, and so it was completely new. And she was trying to figure out what the plants were that indigenous people used. Um, and then, um, you know, that was that became this kind of signature mix of this grass mix that she she found. Um, also, when that project was um, sort of there was an addition put on um, in like two thousand, let me say nine or ten, and uh, it was redone. And um, she she was starting to talk to the Musqueam because she discovered that she and Arthur were really like the Haida, the Haida work, but, but the site was on Musqueam land. And so she began to change the plant material to, to Musqueam plant material. So that's kind of an interesting um, feature of that project. Thank you. And also a question about the National Art Gallery in Ottawa. Because she designed, yes. worked on designing yeah. that as well. She did, um, and she started designing that in the late 80s and was working with Moshe Safdie, who was the architect. And she created several gardens there. Her, probably her most famous is the Tiger Garden, which uh, is pretty radical for Ottawa landscape. Because when you think of the Ottawa landscape, you think red tulips and <laughs> you know, cherry trees and right, things right. that are, you know, sort of looking like a capital city. And so she's got like this rock, rocky landscape with these twisted pines and these, because um, she was very much um, interested in AYA's uh, paintings and um, the, the sort of 
the Canadian artist that was looking to the, the Canadian forest and the Canadian landscape itself. And so that was really the inspiration for that. The minimalist garden was near the minimalist art was, but um, yeah, that was a, that was a tremendous project. Um, I did a book tour with her um, to the National Gallery. Um, and we always get lots of questions during our book tour. We went all over the world, but we presented the National Gallery and we got this one man raised his hand and said, could you tell me how to prune the pine trees in the Tega Garden? And she said, well, are you the maintenance person? He said, yes, I am. <laughs> so she stood up and she said, follow me. And like a hundred people, including myself, followed her outside from the auditorium out into the Tega Garden in which she instructed everyone how to properly prune uh, the pine trees. So it was, it was really just so spontaneous and um, knowledgeable and um, always willing to share. That's wonderful. Um, there was a question about the a circular feature. And there's a small park opposite the Staples main entrance. I believe that's in Vancouver. Did she design that? If you're talking about the Jim Everett Memorial Park that's on UEL at the UBC Probably. campus. She did, she designed that park. And um, it's, it's really interesting because it used to be just kind of a, triang a traffic triangle. And uh, the family raised money and they were able to get funding to actually create a proper park. And that it's an oval and actually what it does is it's a soccer field, but you don't really know it because it's not screaming, I'm a soccer field, you can only play soccer here, but, but it helps keep the balls is a sunken oval and then she took the soil that was taken from the old sunken oval and then created these other mounds for kids to slide on and um, that was a really interesting project because the neighbors wanted play to be a component of it and she had all natural play she had trees to climb rocks to scamper up and uh, she was told by one neighbor that she was un-canadian for not putting in play equipment and then after it was built, the same neighbor said that she was right, that it was it was totally Canadian to have the natural landscape as a source of play. And um, so Cordelia was quite pleased with that. Good. Now, what about the Simon Fraser campus? Uh, did she have any input to any, or did she work on any projects on that campus? No, no, not okay. that I'm aware of, no. Okay. I also wonder, it really fascinated me when I was reading about her, about the creative playgrounds that that seemed to be a passion of hers. Where did and, and also I see that you're continuing mm -hmm. to work in that area. What what was it that sparked this? What made that important? It obviously was important in her life because you've given so many examples of these creative playgrounds. Right. I think it was really, it goes back to her childhood and her mother, because her mother was very interested in children and gardening and nature. And as a landscape architect, she wanted to use those same skills to, to create places. And I also think a huge inspiration was being a mother and, and, and watching her own kids mm -hmm. play. And I think that just, and I think she always saw that was a place where she could really make a difference with just a few things um, that she could you know, really change a child's life by creating a, a place that he or she would want to explore uh, and play in. And, you know, like I was so struck when I would meet adults saying that they remember playing as children in Expo 67 in her play mm -hmm. space. You know, they would carry these memories, these very positive memories. And so I think she just saw that as a, just a really important area, area for her professionally and personally. I agree. I think it's remarkable. And it really it really fostered the sense of risk for children and then safety and creativity, which, again, when she started was quite unique because yeah. the outdoor play equipment was what people had in parks. And you're continuing that. Yes. That yeah. Sense? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Well, I think we've come to the end of our session. Thank you so much. Uh, this has really been a fascinating talk and what a wonderful woman. And again, I'm going to repeat that she's a woman who history will not forget at all, oh. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so on really behalf of the Emeritus College, thank you so much for this presentation. 
Thank you. There are many compliments to you, Susan, about the wonderful presentation uh, in the chat. So that's really, really good for people to have commented. Oh yeah, Diane Newell. You can see her in ages. She did some work at the Peter Wall, you know. Oh yeah, I think she did. She did the faculty club, didn't she? The, she when it, yeah, it was a faculty club. That was actually that was the very first project she ever worked on with Arthur Erickson. Yeah, that's what I thought. But when we put in um, it, what used to be just regular kind of hotel bedrooms on three of them on the lower floor of the sort of annex to the wall, um, she uh, she came by. We we put two of them together, made a modern sort of a suite is for visiting professors of, of the Institute. And we asked about some landscape outside because it was completely open and never like wall to ceiling to floor windows and uh, that didn't open, but uh, you were looking out onto a bunch of students going back and forth. And she, she is, came dashing right over and got the landscape people, uh, told them what kind of stones to put on the ground. It's, there's a little bamboo, there's certain plants and and she you know of course got got right away what was needed and it was very simple no one would have thought of it and it's great as far as i know it's still there so that's that, that's, that's about uh, you know almost 10 years ago now so yeah you're so she, pleased that she's so enthusiastic she she really has loved that project i mean she has drawings of it from the 1950s that we're looking at at the canadian center architecture and she the last tended for her um when she turned 19, uh, 97 was there in that edition that got put on um, yeah so yeah so it was a special place for her but you've, you've shown how she sort of followed her own work and she wasn't aggressively trying to keep everything pristine that she had done but she helped people with the, the modifications that for one reason or another had to be made and, mm -hmm. and 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 she did always have ideas about it and wanted to be involved but she wasn't pushy about it at all she just was enthusiastic I would say yeah very very nice it must, it's so fun to be able to work on a subject like that um, yeah it, especially when you have a whole book as well and not just an article to do yeah, so. yeah it was <laughs> quite an undertaking <laughs> So on the um, screen in front of you are the upcoming events. So you can see the list of them. And we, Yost spoke before about our next general meeting, uh, which is scheduled for November 17th at noon with Jane Coop and David Gilham. So we hope that we can see you there. And thank you so much for attending this afternoon's talk and annual ge and general meeting. Thanks. Thank you.